Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to the third Bitcoin Cash DAA meeting. At least that's what it's billed as. Um, my name is David R. Allen, and I am hosting this meeting. And I am going to do things in a slightly different order this time around. Uh, we're going to go through introductions first, then we're going to talk about the reason for this meeting. And then we're going to talk about the format, which is actually the agenda or the, the way we're going to proceed. And then we're going to um, go into the specifics um, that you guys will decide. So uh, without any further ado, on my top left, Mr. Scott Roberts Zowie. I am Scott Roberts. I have an interest in difficulty algorithms. Great, thank you. Then you've come to the right place. Uh, next, I have Jonathan Tuman. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Um, I like fixing things that are broken, and I think the difficulty decimal algorithm qualifies. Okay. Jacob Elisoff. Hey, folks. Uh, Jacob Elisoff here. I um, just have. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun correcting you every single time. Um, All right. it's, it's okay. I, I take no offense. Sorry, this is my whole intro now. But basically, I'm, I'm interested in difficulty adjustment. Oops. Okay. Um, <laughs> good one. Uh, and I do apologize when I get names wrong. I should spend more time trying to get pronunciation correct. Um, and Anthony Zigzag. Hey, I'm Anthony Zegers. And yeah, I work on Bitcoin ABC. Great. Thank you, Anthony. And I did that on purpose. Uh, Omri Sachet. Yeah, I'm Omri Sachet. I'm the lead developer of Bitcoin ABC. Great. Thank you. And uh, long time no see, Mark Lunderberg. Hi, I'm Mark Lunderberg. Uh, interested in difficulty algorithms also, but also a Bitcoin Cash developer for a while. Worked on past consensus upgrade selection or in so, yeah. Great. Thank <clears throat> you, Mark. Um, Chris. Yeah, I'm uh, Chris Facia from BCHD. Okay. Um, and we're going to have, we'll go to Josh Ellithorpe first. Yep, I'm Josh Ellithorpe. I work on BCHD. Uh, I've been working on a bunch of BCH projects for some time. Great. Thanks, Josh. And Free Trader, I will read whatever you type. Uh, let's see. Hi, uh, I'm Free Trader, maintainer of Bitcoin Cash Node. Okay, thank you for that. So um, we sort of did a, a, a soft welcome from me. I'm not gonna go into any speeches at this point. Uh, next uh, on the agenda is to determine the reason for the meeting. The reason I kind of want to talk about this is this to my way of thinking was a follow-up to the DAA developer meeting number two, where we would talk about progress on development, implementation and specification. Um, if that works, Great. Um, so maybe we could just make sure that that's why we're all here today. Hearing no objections, I guess that's why we're here. Um, so the format for the meeting, uh, I've read the rules of engagement in the past and you guys have seen them before. I don't think I need to go through them again. Uh, I, what I would like to do is talk about suggestions for the agenda and what do you want to talk about um, specifically and, um, in, and then we'll do an acceptance of the agenda. So we sort of left that part of it open. And if you would like to tell me the specific items, I'll put them in a particular order and we'll go from there. So maybe who would like to start by saying what should be on the agenda? Um, one thing that uh, we might want to talk about is how we can achieve consensus. Um, it seems that uh, last week we had um, fairly like strongly set opinions yep. and those opinions were not universally shared. There was a large agreement between one side and then there was small agreement between the other side. Um, so trying to perhaps uh, set down a, a meta agreement for how to make agreements um, might be one step forward in uh, resolving this issue. Okay. Um, I've made a note, uh, how can we achieve consensus? 
and I will, let, I will entertain other ideas that should be on the agenda, and then we'll talk about what order those shall be in. So any other things you would like on the agenda? We could spend the whole meeting talking about how we achieve consensus. Well, um, maybe it would be good to have um, some discussion of what people think are practical risks uh, or, you know, attack exploits and so on of the algorithms on the table. Um, my, my sense is there are not very many practical exploits of the, of the algorithms, but, you know, if anyone has any, it would be great to hear about them. That's great, Jacob. I've got that down as what are the practical risks of uh, the algorithms on the table? Anyone else? So are we doing follow up from the last meeting? Because I just had a, a follow up thing. Sure. Do you want to let me give us a, a, a subject for it and we can get the order of it later? Oh, I don't know. It was just like I had a, I had a comment and question, I guess. Can you give me a broad context of whether it fits in the two things that we've already talked about or is it something new? No, not really. It was more, uh, well, are we having follow-up from the last meeting or what's our first? Sure, you can put, a, I'll just put follow-up from the last meeting and maybe we could do that first. I don't, I'm not gonna try and drive this. You guys will decide. We could also just have an open floor and just let people bring up whatever small issues or large issues they want to. Yeah, the only problem with that, Jonathan, is it does tend to become a little more chaotic. So try, I, I just want to get a little bit more stream to this so that the people watching it don't have to jump all over the place to see stuff. So, yeah. so I think that something that's important is um, whether or not these affect like marketing and branding of Bitcoin Cash. If there's a difference in, you know, how people talk about the coin, uh, because I see, you know, some uh, things that do impact that in these proposals. Okay, I'm going to just write down item number D, marketing. Now, explain to me again in short words, Josh, what you mean. So uh, the one of these proposals uh, will make us the slowest confirming block time uh, of any coin. So literally mar on the marketing side, um, the uh, people that are comparing Bitcoin Cash and saying, talking about the block times and confirmations over the next five years, uh, Bitcoin Cash will be dead last. Um, okay. And there is so, a perceived value there. So let's just call it marketing side comparing other cryptocurrencies. Is that work? Exactly. Thank you. I'm just going to spell it wrong, but that's okay because you won't see it. All right, uh, next, anything else that you would like to see on the agenda? Okay, we'll pull T later. Um, so, the, so what I have is four items right now. Um, I'm gonna make the suggestion that we do the follow-up from the last meeting first. Are you guys okay with that? Any objection? All right. Good. And then I'm going to suggest that it be one of these three that follows that one. How can we achieve consensus? What are the practical risks of the algorithms on the table? And the marketing side comparing other cryptocurrencies. Uh, does that order seem like it would work for you guys? It, it sounds good to me. I, I just, I'm just noting that Free Trader has some comments on the chat here. Oh, I'm you... terribly sorry, Free Trader. It's hard because I'm using a very small font for you and not on purpose. Um, I also had a couple of questions during last meeting that fit into Anthony's follow-up of the last meeting, SIM results from Grassberg. Okay, let's copy that and put it into uh, as a subset of the follow-up and then we can go from there. Anything else that anybody would like to add to the agenda? Did you see the concerns about recent unilateral announcements by ABC coming from Free Trader? I beg your pardon? David, uh, David I think you might have skipped over one of Free Trader's comments. He said concerns about recent unilateral announcements by ABC. Uh, that strikes me as being something that he'd want to have um, in the follow-up from the last meeting, correct? Yeah. Okay. I will put that in uh, as the first follow-up to the last meeting. 
and then I'm going to give it to you guys and you guys can figure this, out. This might fit inside of the consensus uh, conversation, but I also think it's really important. Uh, like what is the proposal process uh, that we want to do for all of the different node implementations uh, rather than saying like, we're doing this. Uh, do we want to have a culture where proposals are the first step? Um, and I think that that's a really important distinction. Uh, so I don't know if that is covered by the other topics, but it's something that is, uh, I think we should discuss. Why don't I do that as an add-on to how, how can we achieve consensus? Okay. What, what is the process? Does that work? Works for me. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else to add to the agenda in any particular order? How you achieve consensus also strongly ties into marketing. Sure. So, do you want to do you want to move the marketing item? I, to uh, I'm just throwing that out there so that we don't forget it when we get back to marketing. Okay. So it seems to me as I I'm gonna I'm gonna show this to you guys. I'm just gonna put it in the meeting. I used to know how to use a computer. Here we go. All right. So there's the items um, that we just talked about. Follow up from the last meetings, concerns about recent unilateral announcements by ABC, SIM results from Grasper. How can we achieve consensus? What is the process? Uh, what are the practical risks of the algorithms on the table and the marketing side comparing other cryptos? Um, does that work? I got one thumbs up. Sounds Two. good to me. Okay. I've got three people saying it's okay. This is good. Uh, so we're going to go with that. That's going to be our agenda for today. And I would like you guys to put your hand up when you're going to talk. And the only exception to that is free trader. Although there is a hand up function that we can sort of keep an eye open for if you do, uh, if you want to use that as well. But in the meantime, um, I think we'll just start on to the meeting and see how it goes. And if you guys at any point want to um, speak to a specific thing, you, please you know, indicate that so that I don't move past if there's a list of people who are waiting to talk. So I'll start off with the follow-up from the last meeting. And Anthony, you were the one that had said you wanted this on the agenda. So I'm going to yeah. let, let you start it. Okay. That mosquito. Yeah, like basically, um, well, as Josh had suggested, I took some time. I was thinking through the meeting and what we talked about. And one of the things was at the end, there was basically like, discussion of like a kind of like a yay nay vote on whether we thought historical drift correction was a good idea or not. And it kind of got me thinking because obviously like whether you think it's a good idea or not is highly dependent on all the details and like what the parameters are and so on. So I saw, I think I saw Mark discussing that, but I'd basically just be interested to hear if, if Mark or anyone else has like suggestions on on the per, on the parameters for historical drift correction, and if you think like have a suggestion for how those could be improved, or, or like assuming that we're that that's happening, because um, I think that would be interesting. Like it's obviously like you could obviously have really bad parameters for it that would make it a bad idea. So I'm wondering what, like, or if anyone else maybe has thoughts on that. Well, uh, yeah, just to respond to that. Um... Uh, I mean, because it's like a two loop control algorithm, I would just say you need to run uh, simulations with the varying the parameters and find where's like the edge of stability and then make sure you're very far from uh, the instability point. And it just, uh, I think that's kind of a, a practical question for the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. the different response. Um, sorry. Um. On that note, I would like to say that it's important that um, for the uh, absolute control loop, um, the clipping, if there is clipping, it should be uh, relatively tight and the uh, time constant should be long. Those are the two things that determine the stability um, or that influence the stability uh, in my experiments. Um, you can also um, get rid of the clipping window entirely and just turn the time constant into something that's very, very long. 
and uh, Jacob Eliasoff has been looking into that and that does uh, seem to work. But um, that means very long, like on the order of years rather than weeks. Um, and uh, as soon as you get rid of the clipping, there are actually attacks um, that can be pre uh, performed against it. And the magnitude of those attacks depends on, uh, like the amount of, that you can gain depends on uh, the clipping. The uh, amount of time that you have to spend on the attack or the, the, like, the duration of the attack in order to get those gains depends on the time constant. So um, yeah, it's, it's uh, in terms of like what can go wrong, um, and avoiding things uh, going wrong. Um, those are uh, some of the things that you'd want to do. Um, there are also philosophical arguments for how um, drift correction can be done in as non-damaging as uh, a way as possible. And I think that those also um, would be similar in that you'd want it to be uh, slow and long. I just want to point out that if at any point you want to share your screen as well, just give me a little bit of a heads up because it does affect how this the flow goes. Um, I know that last time there was some screen sharing that took place and I'm, I'm not discouraging it in any way. I just like to know in advance, that's all. Um, any further comments on this uh, subject? Uh, Jacob. Just a very quick follow up uh, in reply to Anthony. Um, we did look at in the past, like when we were looking at non-exponential smooth moving average versus uh, versus exponential moving average, there were categories of uh, DAAs that we looked at there that I would say were just kind of, to me, they were just kind of broken. So you could look at them and say, this is just not going to work. This is going to produce worse. It's going to be more exploitable and it's going to produce more erratic block times and more oscillations than the alternative. So that, that was something where you could look at some of the alternatives back then and say, this is just not going to work in practice. My take is that that is not the sort of uh, decision uh, that we're looking at here. I, I think in practice, um, although as Jonathan mentioned, I have like poked at an alternative way to set up Grassberg so that it would, it would um, change the block time much more gradually over time. It's not in practice. I don't think that the way it's, from what I can see, the way it's implemented right now, it's not like it would lead to all sorts of attacks or all sorts of oscillations. So I think relative to other times we've made comparisons like this, this comparison to me is less about like, which one is easier to attack, which one has bugs, and more about really what we want to do. You know, like it's really more about what you're trying to accomplish rather than are you screwing up how you're accomplishing it. Okay, thanks. Anthony? Oh, I just said, okay, thanks for that. That pretty much okay. answers my question. No further. Any further follow-up? Uh, Scott? Um, are we sure Grassberg, as it is, has no bugs? Anybody like to answer that question? It has a bug. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> it, it, tell us about that bug. Um, it's actually something that Mark uh, found uh, a couple of days ago, I think. Um, there's a uh, choice of time constants uh, that's wrong. Um, or the choice of, uh, uh, in one line, there's a, like ideal block time, I think, that should be a um, target block time. Um, I don't know if that's a bug or. Eh, I guess it's just a, yeah, it's, I consider it a mistake. Okay, Scott had asked the question if there were any um, bugs. And so anybody else want to have any comments on that? Well, I, I, want, I want some assurance that somebody knows there is no exploitable bug. I, I, I guess that's impossible to know, but uh, I would like some, since it's more complicated and I, I know what kind of review went into Jonathan. Uh, I, I feel safer with it. So I wanted, I was looking for some sort of assurance from, from. Anyone want to speak to Scott's comments? Um, Jonathan? I don't, I don't know about exploitable, but uh, there is um, the fast forward attack 
which is um, uh, definitely theoretically something that can happen, but practically is not something that uh, is likely to happen too much. Um, um, but uh, Grasper definitely does 12.5% worse on the fast forward attack uh, than um, assert or assert uh, would do. And that 12.5% is directly the result of the um, historical drift correction mechanism that they have. Um, whether a fast forward attack is a concern or not kind of depends on whether we're actually worried about 51% attacks happening. And in 51% attacks or 101% attacks or whatever you want to call them uh, that are long term, uh, like one day or longer, then the magnitude of the fast forward attack can be added to whatever other revenue an attacker can get. So um, they might uh, be expected to gain maybe a million dollars from being able to do double spends or being able to short the market. Um, they might be expected to gain uh, $100,000 or so in addition to that uh, by doing a fast forward attack and by simultaneously in parallel uh, attacking the mining incentives. Um, so it's not like the fast forward attack is itself not sufficient motivation to attempt these attacks, but it can make it marginally worse um, uh, for those kinds of attack scenarios. So I want to make sure that the panel all get a chance to talk. We have a number of people commenting in the audience, in the outside audience, um, but I want to come back to those things. But Scott, did you want to speak first? Okay. Uh, so Jonathan, uh, you're sure it does not have any underflow or overflow problem? I haven't looked that closely at it. Um, Amari's spent a lot more time on uh, the code that I have. So has, I think, uh, Jochen Heineke. Um, so I would have to defer to them. Okay, and just for the people in the audience, if you have a question that's specific to this particular topic, uh, please type it in in the Q&A. And, uh, but we'll come back to that after the panels had their chance to go around. Who was next? Uh, do I see somebody's hand up? I'm sorry, maybe I didn't. Okay, well, let's go to um, one of the first questions that came out was uh, from, uh, I don't, I'm not gonna read the name, but um, is the question, do there exist any parameters that would make Grasberg a good idea? Uh, anybody wanna answer that? I'm, I think the, it sounds um, like the current parameters are pretty good. So that's sounds. Anthony, do you want to be specific? I, I'm not sure I understand the question. And well, I mean, it's a loaded question. I don't know if it's it's not really worth answering. It's like yeah. I agree, too loaded. I okay. agree that that's a loaded question, and you know, some people are. Gonna, I think we should be talking about, uh, you know, whether or not you know the theoretical change. Um, the difference between these two algorithms, I think, is the more important topic. Okay. Think, uh, the simulators, um, you know, Jonathan added it to his simulator. Um, we've seen some of the numbers, and I think there's just been less testing from the rest of the community on Grasper. So I'd be curious uh, for people that have simulated it themselves or added it, um, you know, whether or not it performed correctly. Um, the code is probably fine. I think that the, the real crux of it is whether or not the drift correction is required and whether or not that complexity is required. Um, and so I'm spending a lot of time on whether or not the implementation of that idea is correct uh, when the thing to debate is the idea itself, um, I think is missing the point. Okay. Um, so we're still doing the follow-up from the previous meeting. And I want to make sure that um, before we get into the second item um, that we've covered off uh, follow up from the last meeting. Anything further from the last meeting? Jacob. Uh, I had forgotten about this, but there was a question. Um, this came up on the last call and then I went away and uh, did some more trying to understand it and, um, you know, tweeted about it and so on. But um, there was a question, Emma, we had brought up the, um, the idea, as I understood it, that part of the reason, part of the motivation for Grassberg is if we're making larger changes to the DAA, if we're not just patching bugs, as we have been largely in the past, um, and if we're making changes that already bring up 
the idea of drift correction, then we should try to do drift, cor drift correction in a sort of sensible way, a way that we'll be comfortable with for years. Um, and like that intuition made sense to me that if you're gonna re revisit a bigger topic, you wanna get it right. But the, the, what I'm bringing up right now is, I, it was hard for me to understand, like, I think he was, I think Amori was saying that um, introducing assert already, um, I should decide whether to call it assert or assert, anyway, assert, whatever, um, introducing that already introduced an element of drift correction. So given that we were introducing that, the sort of, the topic was already on the table and we should, we should approach it in a sensible way. Um, and when I, and I think on the call, I agreed to that. And when I went away and thought about it, it just didn't seem right to me. Like I, I don't, it's, it's not clear to me in any way that uh, ACERT introduces drift correction. This seems to me something new that Grassberg brings in. So this is a bit of a big topic, but it is something that uh, came up in the last meeting and that we, um, it's probably worth, I would be very curious to hear the argument that ACERT does introduce drift, drift, drift correction. So Jacob, if yeah. I'm reading this correctly, are you asking a question specifically of Omri? Well, or, or other people who I, he's the one uh, who I heard make that argument. Um, but, you know, I, I'd be here curious to hear from anyone on that, on, on any, any arguments uh, as to how ACER introduces drift correction. Just raise your yeah. hand. Oh. Okay, Omri, go um, ahead. No, I kind of, so you, you wrote a piece about it. Uh, so I read it and I think that you are correct in stating that strictly speaking, assert doesn't introduce strict correction. Um, I, I don't think that changed very much of anything because like the, the reason this was on the table to begin with is like, this is what put the question on the table, right? And what's the question on the table you want to address it? It doesn't really matter if Acer actually does that or, or not. Like once you, um, once you have that question on the table, and it's a very important question because we are talking about the, the schedule at which coins are emitted and if we want to stick to a schedule or not. And, and therefore, once the question is on the table, uh, it needs to be addressed. In fact, in my opinion, this should have been a question uh, that we ask ourselves with previous DAA discussion as well. Um, and, and we did not, this was a blind spot on the part of everybody in the community, I think. And, um, and, and the fact that there is this absolute form of answer, you know, got people to ask that question. Um, and, and I think this is an important question, regardless of, of this answer. Strictly speaking, does it or not? Which I, I think you made a pretty good case that it does not. Okay, so well, that's uh, clear. Thank you. I'm going to. Uh, I have two hands up. First one will be Jonathan, and then Mark Lundeberg. I'll be quick. Um, I do believe that uh, Astrid has drift correction, and I said it before, and I'm going to say it again. But it's not universal drift correction. It's just drift correction for rounding errors. Um, the drift that happens from hash rate changes still happens with assert. Uh, the hash rate or the, the drift that happens from, from rounding errors does not. That gets corrected. Great. And Mark? Uh, oh, yeah. I just wanted to, <clears throat> I just wanted to point out, um, I mean, this is a private note, I guess. I, I mean, I didn't really talk about this any, with anyone, but uh, when I first thought of this drift correction idea, I was playing around with it as a toy idea. That was um, before I came up with assert, it was in, I think uh, we were talking about some other difficulty algorithms, like the linear weighted moving average and whatnot. And I was thinking like, oh, you could like just change the block time to, uh, something else if you wanted to compensate for drifts that might build up. And, you know, that it is something you can do with any difficulty algorithm. So, um, for me, I guess I'm just saying for me, it's not a new idea. It's just like kind of a toy idea that's it's been there all along, and uh, I never, I never really thought it was worthwhile to explore. Like I sort of, I'd sort of thrown it away <laughs> a long time ago. So, um, I mean, I'm happy that everyone else is thinking about the problem as much as as others have in the past. But uh, I'm surprised that people are coming to a different conclusion there. I guess, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, Jacob. <clears throat> Just a quick follow-up on what Jonathan said. Um, understood about the uh, drift correction for rounding. Um, 
uh, that's specifically with the absolute form, right? Where you're you're measuring relative to the genesis block and so on. I think R cert does R cert have the anyway. The, the the point I actually want to make is that the drift correction for rounding is a much more minor feature. I mean, this is this is nothing compared to changing the block size by 12 percent. So it's it's I see your point intellectually, but uh, you know people should understand that it, it for, for the purposes of the, the large scale drift correction we're talking about here, uh, that is not present in us. It's well. It's an important point. Like generally it's more reference like numerical stability or something like that. It's like, you know, every time you do a compute, like you can have the perfect mathematical formula, but every time you plug it into a computer, you're gonna have rundings left and right that happens, right? And you want always to ask yourself, does this rounding get eliminated somehow? Or do I accumulate more and more and more and more error as I go? And And there is a whole class of, algorithm that works on paper if you run the math, but if you implement them, they just don't work because you accumulate the error and at some point you are completely off. Anybody else want to comment on this before I take a question from the audience? Uh, Scott. Uh, I had a quick question. Is Grassberg essentially the same as Jonathan's uh, except it's uh, relative, so it has that uh, little bit of error introduced and uh, the clipping. Right. Uh, otherwise, are they the same algorithm? Uh, Jonathan seems to be saying yes, pretty much. Mm. And the, the absolute correction, like the, the historical drift correction. Um, so I think the question, like, I got yeah. the, sorry, I just got the impression that the question was being asked of Omri. So. Uh, sure. Either. Either that that's fine. I I just, I just wanted to confirm uh, that they were pretty much the same thing, except Armory's uh, Grassberg is uh, relative, and so it's going to have that that error that builds up a little bit, which may be around one percent or something, and and then there's uh, and then there's absolute. Uh, Jonathan's has absolute, and uh, we're, we're so eliminated. And, and then I just wanted to mainly, mainly confirm that the clip is pretty much the primary difference. Could just get you to use your hand, please, Armory. Yeah. So, yeah, it's similar in the sense that it's assert and, and it uses similar parameters. Um, but it's the relative form. It doesn't accumulate the error because the drift correction also um, uh, like serve the same, effectively have the same effect. As, as using the absolute form of assert. Uh, so, so you also eliminate the, the rounding problems uh, that way. And, um, and so you have the drift correction and then the, the clipping is uh, not exactly done the same way. Uh, the clipping is like absurdly big on, on, on Grasberg. It's, it's like, you know, if you run into it, like something already went seriously wrong because basically the clipping is like time four billion or divided by four billion. Uh, the reason it's there is just to make sure that there is no integer of overflow or, or any kind of other funny business uh, this way. But you should never run into this unless someone, you know, craft timestamp. Like there are timestamp crafted in the test suite to make sure that this code is like run and triggered, but uh, you should never expect to see that in practice. Jacob, just before we go, um, I did see a comment from Free Trader. He said, so it is R cert. And Jonathan answered, and Suntumum answered, yes, relative assert is really just R cert. Um, so Free Trader said, the naming of assert always suggests to me that it is referring to the absolute form of the algorithm. So the absolute and relative form are mathematically equivalent, but this is one of those examples I was talking about earlier. The numerical stability doesn't work the same way. So the absolute form like naturally, um, naturally eliminates all the surrounding zeros, whereas the, the, um, the relative form doesn't by itself. However, if you do the relative form plus drift correction, you end up uh, doing it also. Uh, why was the relative form chosen for Grasberg? Question from Free Trader. Yeah. Um, because if you want to do the drift correction, it becomes pretty much uh, very difficult to do in the absolute form. Um, 
and yeah, that's that's the main reason. Um, okay, I have Jonathan with his hand up. Um, yeah, so I posted this like I don't know three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago in the uh, working gram Telegram group. It's actually really easy to do um, historical drift correction with assert. Um, if you think about it, what assert does is it sets difficulty based on the difference between the current box uh, timestamp and some schedule. And you just subtract the intended schedule uh, from the uh, current timestamp. That schedule does not have to be linear. Um, it makes sense to be linear if you want to target 600 seconds per block, but it can be any arbitrary function. So if you want, you can make it piecewise linear. It can be two uh, linear functions. It could be 675 seconds for the next six and a half years followed by 600 seconds after that. Um, or it could be uh, some smooth curve that uh, adjoins them to, or it can be, I don't know, a sine wave, whatever you want. Uh, you can stick that in there and um, uh, assert will uh, make blocks that uh, smoothly um, uh, attempt to approach that, um, that scheduling. Okay, uh, Mark. Yeah, just just want to note. I mean, I think this is clear to those who are in, familiar with all the details. But if you do that, then you don't get the same kind of drift correction because um, what you, what you turn into is you turn into assert the normal assert with uh, the regular drifts that you always get, and you don't correct those um, if you do that sort of piecewise linear approach. Whereas uh, the Grassberg drift correction really gets rid of all the drift, uh, even the drift that uh, would naturally be there if you had run assert from the very beginning of time. So, right. Uh, uh, this proposal uh, gets rid of the historical drift, but not the future drift. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Anything <laughs> further on the from the panel, Jacob? Uh, yeah. Just going back to what Emily was saying earlier, I agree with everything he said about how the, the drift correction as in Grassberg um, already sort of provides an anchor that will clean up any rounding error eventually, you know, over time. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about what he said about, um, about the clipping. Uh, my understanding of how Grassberg works, um, and this is not a criticism actually, I think for what it's trying to do, I think it does it properly, or at least in a very reasonable way, is that the clipping, the clipping is, is essentially bounding the block time, the target block time, between eight minutes, 45 seconds and 11 minutes, 15 seconds. And then for the first, you know, five or six and a half or whatever it is years, the target is always bound, uh, capped at the 11 minutes and 15 seconds. So in that sense, the clipping is applied, you know, every, every block for the next several years. Um, again, I don't think this is a problem, but that, that's just, I, I, it's, it doesn't seem quite right to me to say the clipping only very rarely kicks in. Maybe that's yeah. true in the eventual state. Yeah, so, so uh, this is not, yeah, this is not the clipping I was talking about. There is another clipping on, you know, like many difficulty adjustment algorithms have some clipping of how much you can adjust the target. And um, well, you notice that when you have this kind of stuff, usually, you know, it protects against some attacks, but it also opens different attacks. And it always have been like a, f a funny business uh, to deal with those. And, and so in that case, there is, there is a clipping, but it's, uh, it's set to absurd value. And the reason is just to um, make sure you don't like, you know, shift by too much speeds and, and start losing this and stuff like that. Um, there is a clipping on the drift correction so that you don't, you know, because there is a lot of drift that has happened in the past. If you don't clip the drift correction, you just end up with like a stupid correction that is like way too high. And, and so, so that, but that's not what I was talking about. Yeah, this one is like severely clipped and it's on purpose. It's not, um, not disturb the user experience too much. Okay, the next uh, question is coming from Jacob. Yeah, thank you. Just because I wanted to quickly respond to that. Uh, okay, I understand what you're saying. So there's a clip on the drift correction, but then there's a separate clip on, uh, I guess it would be the sudden target block time change or the change in difficulty or something like that. And you're saying yeah. that the second one is, is only a very extreme uh, clipping that should very, very be hit. That, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. And Jonathan? Um, this is more of like an agenda item or like meta comment. Um, but um, we're spending a lot of time on Grassberg. And um, I would also appreciate it if 
uh, people um, tried to also address uh, my proposal, my team's proposal, the SRD 3 2D. Um, and like, if anybody has any problems with it and thinks that it's uh, deficient in some way, like, please also try to keep that in mind and, and bring that up. Um, I don't want us to only talk about problems with Rasper. I want us to also talk about problems with SRD 3 a if they exist. Okay, and uh, do you see that as being part of the follow-up from the last meeting, Jonathan? I mean, I think it's something that should have been discussed last meeting, but we just didn't have time to because we were so focused on the drift correction. Uh, it was discussed a bit in the meeting for that, but um, so it's, I guess it's a follow-up to, uh, to the grandparent meeting. Okay, um, so do you want to talk about that now then? Um, I mean, it's my proposal, so I, I think that I should not be the one to open the discussion on it. If anybody okay. else does, they should. Is there anybody that would like to speak to Jonathan's proposal? I do have a question from a gentleman in the audience as well, but I'll read that after uh, we finish with this part. Uh, Jacob. Sorry. Uh, yeah, just very briefly. I mean, uh, I, I mean, maybe I'm a little biased, but I, I think again, in terms of what it's trying to do, I think, I think Jonathan's proposal is like more or less perfect. Like it could probably be tested further and so on, but I, I don't know of any, there's nothing I would change about it at all. So to me, it's not a question of are there bugs or problems? Again, it, it's really more a question of there's two different things you could be trying to do, clean up the, uh, you know, sort out the block time distribution and clean up the oscillations without drift, drift correction, which leads very naturally to something like Jonathan's proposal or with drift correction, which leads to something at least like Amory's proposal, I think. Um, so it, part, I, I guess what I'm really saying is I think part of the reason we haven't discussed technical flaws with Jonathan's proposal is because I, I'm not aware of any. Okay. Thank you for that. Anybody else, uh, Scott? Um, you know, I, I like Jonathan because it's a lot shorter, uh, simpler. I like the, I like the variable name. Um, and, uh, you know, if his was not sufficient, uh, a uh, drift correction could have been included in Jonathan's. I, I've shown Homery and Jonathan the equation that can be used in either that uh, I, I had, I worked on it myself and came up with sort of an assert inside of an assert to adjust the, the target block time. And then uh, talking with Mark, he showed me that really you can make it simpler and uh, showed me an error I had. So Mark has a proposal for correcting, for adjusting the block time that corrects for historical drift and any future drift that it could be from truncation errors or from just the, the natural the drift, that natural drift that occurs in any assert. Uh, it, uh, you know, there, there, is, there is a perfect assert there and I think it's a fairly small change to Jonathan's and it would include everything in Grassberg and a little bit more and, and a little bit better correction uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and do everything that Grassberg is doing. Would anyone else like to speak to Jonathan's proposal? Mark? Uh, sure, I think you mentioned one of my ideas. Um, are you talking about the linear approximation thing that I sent you? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, yeah, that was, I mean, I think that could work as an algorithm, I guess, but it wasn't really intended as a, as a difficulty algorithm. I was just thinking of something if you wanted to boil it down for analyzing it in the simplest form. Um, that is that that was a form that only works for the relative exponential algorithm, though. I think um, I don't think that would adapt to the, the absolute one. It was basically I was just trying to uh, linearize Grassberg, basically. Uh, so take out all the exponentials, take out the clipping, and then yeah, that was basically the well, idea. Well, the, the way the way to adjust, uh, I I think it would. Uh, I'll have to look into it and try to see. Uh, why it may not work in absolute, uh, but I, I thought it would. But anyway, we'll leave it there. Thanks, Scott. Uh, any further comment? Jo Omri, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Jonathan? Um, quick response to Scott. Um, yeah, uh, there are lots of ways to add uh, drift correction, both historical and future, um, to my proposal. I personally consider um, historical drift correction to be an explicitly bad idea and to be um, deleterious in terms of the philosophy and in terms of the effects it would have. So 
Uh, that's why I chose not to uh, explore those. Um, the future drift correction, I considered to be basically inconsequential and uh, not worth the benefit. Um, those are just my personal biases though. Um, but I, I just wanna make sure that, yeah, it's interesting to uh, investigate uh, these possibilities, um, but uh, sometimes design decisions are made not based on what you can do, but based on what you should do. Any further comments from the panel before I read the audience question? No? Um, so this is from a gentleman named Rick. He says, everybody is against Grassberg's 11 30 minute blocks, 11 colon 30 minute blocks. That is because Grassberg chose the Genesis block as the anchor point. But what if we use Grassberg and choose the anchor point as block 478559 August 2017 the block which was B, the block BCH was born that way we have some drift that was inherited before the fork but on BCH we will have 10 minute blocks this way we can choose a point block that I think everybody will be happy with what's your take on this so that's general anybody want to answer that Mark uh. Yeah, well, I was I was going to see if Jonathan was going to say something, but uh, it, just as a general remark, yeah, you can um, with the drift correction or drift measurements in general, you can define drift bit from any point that you want in the past. So um, there are lots of interesting uh, sort of special events that happened in the history of drift, and um, I think there's at least four points that you could think of choosing, and that is one of them. So yeah. Okay, and Jacob was quick to correct. It's actually 11.15. Thank you. Uh, um, and uh, Rick said, thank you for the answer. Um, a free trader says, since I don't have the exact number, I have to point at this relative source. And then there's a read.cash article called Big Block If True. Oh, so written by Big Block If True, Bitcoin Cash Historic and Forecasted Drift. Uh, Mark, do you want to address that first? <coughs> Oh, sorry, I just wanted to add something, uh, which was, if you were to do that um, drift correction based on August 1st, 2017, then it would result in still some years of slow blocks followed by, and reduced coin emission schedule, followed by uh, the return back to normality, let's say. So it would just be a shorter time. Okay, thank you, Mark. has something probably more to say on this, because he's thought a lot more about this. Yes, he's had, he has his hand up. Uh, Jonathan. And, uh, warning, screen share. Go, go for it. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the warning. So uh, what we have here is a three-dimensional plot of all of the Bitcoin cash blocks in history. And it's uh, you know, uh, 600,000 uh, data points, so it'll be a little bit slow. Um, but uh, so we've got three axes. We've got um, down here, the timestamp or the, the date stamp uh, on the x-axis, we've got the number of hours of uh, drift from um, what the timestamp quote should have been, end quote, if it was Genesis plus 600 seconds per block. And on the y-axis, we have um, the log two of difficulty. So basically, we have logarithmic scale of difficulty uh, vertically, and then uh, drift on this, it's now the x-axis, and then y-axis for uh, date. And in this plot, you can see some really interesting things. For example, if we take just the right perspective, um, we can see that along this segment, everything follows within or falls within a very uh, tight plane. Um, this segment, by the way, um, with all the wavy lines, that's the BTC era. So BTC era starts here, Genesis block, and ends right up here. And um, except for the initial segment right here, when uh, mining wasn't consistent, um, the BTC era has this very clean relationship, very tight relationship, except for like the you know, stepwise um, uh, nature of exchanging log two difficulty for drift uh, on a two-week schedule. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, that is actually exactly the property that assert was designed around. Um, at the end of the BTC era, 
we have, let me see if I can get a good perspective on this. We have these two right angles. And in the first era, we have the EDA and we have this motion to the right in the current perspective. That's about, grumble, uh, it's about 2000 hours worth of drift that happened in three months. Um, within that, let me see if I can zoom in a bit. Uh, it's not happening quite right. Oh well. Uh, within that, we see this pattern in which the difficulty goes down, then the drift goes to the right, then the difficulty goes up, then the drift goes to the left a little bit, then the difficulty goes down, right, etc., cetera, uh, over and over again. And that's because of the oscillations that were happening. We, we would see that um, mining rate would be slow, which would cause the EDA to trigger, which would cause the difficulty to go way down, which would cause a uh, hash rate to come in, which would cause blocks to come in, uh, and so forth. And that oscillation would just repeat on a uh, like three day or so basis. Um, and meanwhile, lots of drift was occurring. Uh, then once we have the, uh, the uh, CW111 DAA activated, we see, um, so on, on this axis, right, left to right, we now have uh, time. And on the vertical axis, we have drift. The drift disappeared as soon as the CW111 DAA uh, was created. It didn't completely disappear, but it became very, very small. Um, so like as of November 13th, 2017, the drift has been basically inconsequential. It's been 1.7 seconds out of every 600 seconds on average. Um, uh, I also do have some other uh, graphs that zoom in on that. And you also do see the same, uh, uh, what was it, counterclockwise looping pattern that you saw in the DAA, or sorry, in the EDA. You saw the same counterclockwise looping in the uh, EDA as you see in the DAA, just compressed into a much, much narrower uh, drift window and uh, with much higher frequency. Um, and so you get those, those spirals, basically. So the question is, of these, all of the points on this, uh, this line, what would be the best point uh, to choose as a reference block? And I think there are some uh, reasonable options. There's some, sh some shelling points. Um, the first shelling point is the Genesis block. Um, that would be January 3rd. I think that this is actually a particularly bad option because January 3rd was six days before Bitcoin was published. There was no uh, chance for anybody to mine at that time except for Satoshi. And if we're using that as the, uh, the reference point, that's sort of like saying that um, we should have had a pre-mine or an insta-mine, uh, and the fact that we didn't is an error that we need to correct. So I think a much better choice than the Genesis block is actually block one, uh, which happened uh, January 8th or so. It happened uh, right before um, uh, the source code was published. And uh, that's, that's actually the, the start of the semi-consistent mining. Um, but it wasn't even consistent mining uh, then. As we see here, we have zero hours of drift uh, at the Genesis block, goes up to 3,000, I think, yeah, negative 3,333 hours of drift uh, by December 2009. And in between, the drift was accumulating because A, blocks weren't being consistently mined. Sometimes uh, Satoshi was not mining, sometimes nobody else was mining, and sometimes there would be hours or days in between blocks. Uh, and B, uh, the difficulty adjustment algorithm was not active at that time. The difficulty was pegged, clipped at a difficulty, at the minimum difficulty of one. So uh, the difficulty adjustment algorithm was not targeting an, an average block time of 10 minutes. It was targeting an average block time of however uh, people were mining. And that was a very important decision on Satoshi's part because he wanted to make sure that the coins were not free. He wanted to make sure that there was always a minimum cost to mining. Um, just like with a real gold mine, it doesn't become easier to mine if nobody mines gold at the gold mine for 10 years. Um, doesn't, just because like it's, it's been uh, idle for 10 years doesn't mean that you're suddenly gonna walk in and see a ton of gold. That would be like if it's a farm, not a, a gold mine. Um, so I think that consequently, anything before December of 2009 is a bad idea because we should not reverse that uh, difficulty one era. We should not re reverse 
the era in which the gold mine was not being picked up. Um, then the question is, what about this period between December 2009 and uh, August 1st, 2017? And I would say that, yeah, we shouldn't reverse that either because that wasn't a mistake. That was actually the difficulty adjustment algorithm operating as intended and regulating uh, the, the block intervals um, based on hash rate. Um, it seems like it's extreme drift, but only because the difficulty increased by 40, sorry, 35-ish um, factors of two. Um, it increased by like 100 billion, and that's a massive, enormous change in hash rate. That's uh, billions of dollars worth of investment into mining hardware that went into that. And that's not going to ever happen again. That's not repeatable. Um, that's just a one-time thing. Um, and like the drift, the difficulty adjustment algorithm was always intended to trade off um, at time for difficulty. That's just how it works. Um, so then the question becomes, what about the EDA drift? Like, should we try to reverse this drift? And at that point, I think we're starting to make reasonable arguments. Like, I think there is a reasonable argument to be made for why um, we should correct for this mistake. This was actually our mistake or Amr's mistake. This was something that should not have happened, but did happen. Um, but ultimately, I don't think we should fix this either because the cost of this mistake wasn't that we got an extra 2,000 hours worth of blocks. The cost was that we got an extra, whatever, um, extra couple months worth of money being issued. And if we want to fix the issue, what we'd be doing is going back and taking back those coins that were unjustly and unfairly issued to miners. And we definitely should not do that. Um, they were earned, um, they, like the history of the blockchain should be immutable. So if we're trying to fix the, the, um, the blockchains, the drift, that's just like, you know, uh, it's, I'm failing to get the metaphor here, but it's solving the wrong problem and putting a Band-Aid on like a, a, a cancerous tumor. Like it's, it's not the right way to deal with the problem. It's kind of just um, saying that you're fixing it and doing PR, but completely addressing the wrong issue. And then as for like this drift, this 1.7 seconds of drift in the DAA, like that's not a problem. Um, if we're going to be picking a reference point, really the best reference point is the most recent point. I, so that's, that's my opinion. Um, those are, I think, the, the main shelling points for where difficulty uh, uh, reference points could be, either most recent uh, at the DAA fork, EDA fork, um, end of the diff one mining block one or Genesis block. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that lengthy, I will. lengthy description. And thank you for not sharing your screen any further. Uh, no, I appreciate that. Uh, Jacob, first hand up. Just a small addendum to that. It is really interesting. I hadn't, I'd seen parts of that, but not the entire, uh, not everything that Jonathan said. It is really interesting that so little drift has accumulated since 2017. Um, I just want to highlight that, as I understand it, the only re real reason the drift, we haven't had more drift since then, is because the hash rate for BCH hasn't increased since then. If the hash rate continues to increase, I believe under the current algorithm, we would see drift accumulating just like it did under the BTC era, if they accumulated at that rate, which it might not. Scott, did you have your hand up? Uh, can I actually respond to that? Um, yeah, let Jonathan respond, I would say. Sure. Um, so, that is actually a really interesting point, and uh, the answer is no. The, uh, the CW144 DAA does not drift very much, or almost none, uh, compared to hash rate. You can't see the hash rate changes um, in uh, the horizontal movement in the drift. Um, and I think actually that is related to the reason why the CW144 DAA oscillates. Um, like, if you don't have that relationship between drift and difficulty, if it's not tight, um, if it's delayed or if it's too fast, then you end up getting the potential for those loops happening that I was mentioning, uh, where you get uh, drift happening and then out of phase changes in difficulty, and then out of phase negative drift happening, and then out of phase uh, changes in difficulty. Um, and 
like, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's exactly that issue going on. There are ways to have a driftless DAA that doesn't have those loops, but it's only if you uh, shift out that lateral correction for drift into a very different time scale um, from the, uh, the actual uh, hash rate changes. Uh, so you have to do your, your difficulty regulation in the, the linear fashion where you're trading off uh, difficulty versus uh, drift and then separately through a separate feedback loop with a much uh, longer time constant, do slow drift correction changes. And that is what, uh, that, that is what grass group does. Um, that is not what the DAA does. So yeah, um, the DAA's lack of, uh, of drift is actually not a good thing. Um, there is a second reason, very quick, why the, DAA, the uh, CW144 DAA didn't have much drift, and that's just because it had a 144 block window. Um, the amount of drift is uh, proportional to the time constant or the time parameter or the block, si block uh, window size uh, that you're dealing with. And that's why the drift was relatively large with BTC, 2016 block window, and uh, much smaller with the CW144 uh, DAA, 144 block window. End. All right, before we move on to the next item, I would like to make sure that this has been addressed by everyone that wanted to say something. Uh, I've also noticed that we've got two Jonathan Tumans on the screen, and I'm assuming that uh, the other one is uh, Josh Green. Is that correct? I think that is actually Andrew Stone. Uh, Josh, I don't think, joined. Oh. Um, okay. No, I joined via the link that Tumim gave me. So this is Josh Green. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're mixing mixing things up a little bit here, and yeah, at sorry. Least, at least we know who's who. Uh, anybody like to comment on this so we can wrap up and move to the next item? Um, how do I raise my hand? You just did. All right. Um, I actually found, like I said in the chat, I, I found that to be pretty compelling, and I think um, I think we've kind of uh, qualified assert pretty well. And I think we've identified uh, Grassberg's flaws that are, you know, to be honestly fair, they're technically not, not a long list of them. Um, so uh, if, if that's the case, like, it sounds like we're debating drift correction. I heard a pretty strong argument against historic drift correction. And I want to see if there is, like, in a, in a vacuum, that makes it pretty easy for me to make a decision. Um, but I want to hear perhaps what like Amari's opinion is for justifying historic drift correction uh, in lieu of that evidence. Okay, thank you. Uh, Amari, do you want to address that first? Uh, okay, so Jonathan made different argument for different time window. And so uh, there's just not one argument to address though. There is like one, one of the argument that he made that I reject is the reparation argument where um, like drift correction would be reparation, uh, you know, from some extra money that have been issued at some point. And so therefore we're gonna uh, take that money from someone, but we're not taking money from anyone effectively with drift correction. And so, so this does not qualify as, as reparation. Um, but, but the second one is more generally like the whole approach through which it went is, uh, I'd say like, if you want to go that road, it's actually reasonable, right? Like you look at the time window and wonder what, what you want to pick as a reference point. But um, I, I think this is actually like going down that road where, where things go wrong to begin with. You don't want to be going down that road and, and ask yourself like, you know, like, is it the reference point that we want? Is it like the emission schedule that we want or that we don't want or whatnot, right? Like, because once you do that, once you do that, you left the realm of our money and you are fiat money now because you are deciding on the emission schedule. I muted myself. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, you got your hands up. Um, I've been talking a lot. So if anybody else feels like talking, please uh, raise your hand and take priority over me. I have a, give... comment. I have a comment from Free Trader. I'll read it. Uh, his opinion is bad design decisions that manifest in major drift and oscillations like the EDA have a market consequence. It is hard to see how lengthening the block times could not be seen as another mistake, which may also be priced in. 
I'm looking for hands. Just Scott. There is no question in there. No, there wasn't. Uh, there was the statement that was made. Yeah, I'll, I'll just have to, you know, to me, it's sort of like just leave well enough alone. If if the if too many coins have been emitted, that that's past mistakes. Not everybody is has accepted it in uh, Bitcoin, uh, BTC, um, and I, I, and people expect won't a ten minute block time and so to me it just seems it seems kind of clear it should just be well enough along and keep the 10 minute block times okay and i have a hand up from josh green uh, thanks I, I think uh i think just like unless i misunderstood amari's um, like response it, it like that almost sounds like it's just saying that like bitcoin btc isn't hard money because like basically the drift that we'd be correcting is like their drift. So like like that by like leaving in that historic drift and then someone claiming I don't even know who is claiming it, but by having someone that may or may not exist claiming that we're not hard money because of you know some weird change in emission schedule, like it's literally VTC's emission schedule. So it doesn't it just it just doesn't like I, I just I'm trying to be convinced here and I just don't I just don't have any like it, it, the argument doesn't seem like no, it really has. No, there, there is a very different, like there is something very different about BTC because they purposefully make the choice to not make any decision, right? This is what they are going with. They don't make any decision. And so by definition, they are not meddling with the policy because they don't make any decision. But here we have this meeting to make a decision. And, and, and so this option of not making a decision is not available to us. Like we've already crossed that bridge. Jonathan? Yeah, so we definitely do have an interesting decision to make here. Um, we can decide if we want to meddle with a policy or if we want to not meddle with a policy. And um, like we currently have uh, 6.25 BCH per block, 144 blocks per day. That's 900 BCH. Uh, per day that are being emitted. If we uh, want to, we can change that emission schedule. We can change it to um, 6.25 times 144 divided by 112.5%. Uh, uh, we can you know, enact Grassberg and then what we'll get is we'll get 800 BCH per day for the next uh, four years until we have the halving. Then we'll get 400 BCH per day for another uh, two years. We have the ability to mess with the coin emission schedule. Um, if we want to be hard money, I think the answer is that we definitely cannot do that because it's like, like you said, Omri, it's, it's a violation of the principle that, um, that the coin emission should be determined, predetermined. It should not be under developer control. If we do this this time, then we can do it another time. There has to be some strong line that developers agreed never to cross. And I think that this is on the other side of that line. Um, yeah, uh, I feel like changing the block time is, is more of a manipulation of the emission rate than trying to correct past errors. And it especially seems, since it seems like it's a nearly unilateral decision that's not looking for any community uh, consensus. It is, it is like a centralized decision uh, to change the emission rate. Okay. Uh, next, I have Josh Green's hand up. Uh, yeah, I, I just have to make my opinion uh, clear, I think, too. I think what, you know, John, uh, or Jonathan Tuman was just saying again, like I feel like, I feel like changing. I think I feel like in order to, we are hard money. I think changing the block time makes us. It gives an argument to saying that we are less close to hard money. Uh, so I, I just ultimately all I'm saying is like I, I genuinely came in here uh, multiple times with an open mind, and uh, I think at this point in time I just have to say that I just I'm not convinced. Like I, I just don't hear any new arguments that make any sense. So uh, I, I just kind of. That's just my conclusion. 
Thanks, Josh. I'm going to read a comment from Free Trader. A common argument made in the EDA era, the biggest drift in Bitcoin cash since its fork in August 2017, were mostly deserved earnings by then still relatively loyal miners who had supported two coins. Uh, I think it's supposed to be su supported the coins birth and people were all right with them gaining coins, which they also held and effectively took a risk on the future of Bitcoin cash. I don't at all see the point of worsening confirmation yeah. times in the future to correct for that. Yeah. Um, do I have another hand up? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how to put up my hand. So I think I'm you just did jump in. Um, and to me, it's about what is the total uh, effect on the end user and how much of uh, their expectation is changing based off of changing the block times. And to me, it's a degraded user uh, experience for a number of use cases. And it may be a minor degradation, but it is a degradation, whether or not that's marketing material saying, you know, how fast so, uh, a blockchain's block times are in comparison charts, whether that is the number of uh, change transactions that can occur, whether that is the block size itself. If I'm getting less blocks, that means less overall transactional throughput on the chain per day. So to me, uh, it's not just about the timing. It's do we want to advertise that we're going to reduce capacity, reduce the amount of change transactions that are allowed, and reduce the user experience expectations that have been built up around this project. And I think we're really hung up on like whether or not you know, we should go back and correct this past drift. But I've never seen a large argument to do that, whereas I have seen a large argu uh, argument to fix the block time oscillations that cause you know multiple blocks to happen in a minute and then waiting two to three hours, which is a terrible user experience. That's what I thought we were trying to solve. And I think us looking at it and saying, oh, well, we're gonna change you know, the emission schedule. That to me is making an overt change. And that is to me a, a bigger breach of contract to the end users. And it affects a lot of different people. You know, there's the people that are trading on exchanges that are going to need to wait an additional probably 10 minutes at least because they have to wait six or eight or 10 blocks in order for those confirmations to occur. There are services that are waiting for the initial confirmation that are not on the zero conf bandwagon. That would be a majority of the WooCommerce and Shopify integrations that integrate Bitcoin Cash today. So that's another minute and 15 seconds that they have to wait for their first confirmation on average. And so to me, the question is, is for a theoretical gain of, oh, we're better property of some kind of money, is that still true if we degrade multiple aspects of how the money works in other ways? Um, and I don't think that that trade-off makes a lot of sense. Um, and maybe I'm, I'm not seeing something, but I see like multiple things the end user will have a worse experience with. And I, the only thing I see on the plus side is, oh, well, there's this theoretical thing. We want to make sure that it's as close to 10 minutes. When in Bitcoin, we've never had 10 minute blocks. Not since the first day. We've never had them. They don't, this is like a fantasy and I don't understand why we would take something that's never occurred and make that a requirement on what we want to instigate on the chain when there are clear requirements of things that we need to fix. Yeah, so I can answer to that. Um, so first, yeah, there was never 10 minute blocks on the chain and this is one of the reasons of why we are meddling with, you know, difficulty adjustment to begin with is because like historically they have never worked properly. But, but more to your point, the user, the end user experience is like paramount. Uh, obviously this is, um, I mean, this is what makes or break the success of any project. Um, thing is that argument is really fallacious because like 10 minutes or even if we don't go down to like eight minutes or even less, like this is complete trash. Uh, eight minute confirmation is nothing even remotely close to what any kind of serious payment system is doing today. Um, and and so, so this argument is a bit fallacious. Like, you know, it's like you're selling car and your car goes like 10 miles per hour and you're like, well, they could go 12, right? And 12 is much better because people want fast car. Well, if you sell cars that go 12 miles per hour, you're not going to sell any because nobody is buying this kind of car. And, and same thing, if you sell a, a payment system that process payment in 10 minutes instead of 11, um, 
like both are completely trash. Those numbers are so far off what you know good user experience is like that it's not even funny. Uh, and and this is why we have other tech on the roadmap to to get those problems sorted out. But you know, like that argument is a bit fallacious. Uh, I'd say like those those numbers they are not even remotely close to anything that is good user experience. For so reducing overall throughput for five years on our chain by twelve and a half percent is fallacious. That t- well, look, bad. listen, we are not even using one percent of the throughput we have, and if the throughput goes like one hundred x, you know that we can increase the block size. So uh, this is also very fallacious. Okay. You're muted. I got it. Yes, I have it muted. Um, I do want to point out that we're uh, at an hour and 23 minutes, um, or probably a little bit less than that. And there are a number of other things on the agenda. I think that Josh moved into the marketing side comparing other cryptos in a way, uh, but that doesn't mean we can't revisit that when we come back, uh, when we get to the end of this meeting. I just want to make sure that we're not here for six and a half hours. Um, So, uh, is there any objection to moving on to item number B on the agenda, which was free traders' concerns about recent unilateral announcements by ABC? Anybody object if we move on to that? Jonathan, you're objecting. Yeah, I did want to respond to Amory's uh, point first, and then uh, after that we can. Um, so, uh, Amri also used the car metaphor in uh, the last meeting, um, but that time he said a uh, 65 mile an hour car. Um, I responded to that in chat, but didn't make it into the uh, uh, video. And I think that it's important to mention that you might think that those uh, cars are too slow to be useful, but people are driving them to work every day. And if we change the speed limit from 65 miles an hour down to 55 miles an hour, that does actually impact uh, current users. Sure, it might not be a jet, um, but it's still useful. If you're talking about a 12 mile an hour vehicle, um, there is a market for that. Golf carts are uh, made by the millions, by the tens of millions. Um, Scooters, uh, all these these kinds of devices exist. And if you make them uh, 12.5% slower, slower, they do become less useful. Yes, we need to be uh, also looking at the long game and looking at how we can make this an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude better. But if we start making things uh, slightly worse for our existing users, then we're going to be losing market share, not gaining it. And we're never going to be able to achieve those long-term goals. Uh, Are we good? Everybody had said what they wanted to say? about cars and speed limits. All right, I'm getting some nodding, so this is good. Uh, I'm going to make the assumption then that we uh, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is, um, I'm not sure how this is gonna be addressed because I'll have to read whatever free trader writes, which means that I'm gonna give him a chance to uh, make statements. So the item number B is concerns about recent unilateral announcements by ABC. Uh, could you, um, unless there's somebody else in the panel. Oh, no, he's about to type. Hopefully this will happen relatively fast. Maybe you can all have a glass of water while the typing is taking place. Um, uh, mute yourself. We could ask for some more of Amari's singing to fill the void. No, I guess that was vetoed by Jacob. I mean, you know, I appreciate the sentiment there. Okay, free trader. Okay, free trader says, okay, we know, uh, we know, we now face a situation where one client has declared to go ahead with Grasberg. I think we're going to have to wait until he types each sentence in. But my concern is we have no real SIM results presented by that team. very much lack of data methodology. One day we'll get to hear free traders voice, I'm sure. How can we even include that as an option question mark? 
what we do. So, you know, he knows. Uh, it seems still a way to go, meaning a ways to go. I feel like there should be a drum roll for each one of these. Sorry. It is hard. Um, maybe, well, I, I say, I don't know if he's still typing. It's not like Telegram where I can see. Um, would anybody else like to address what's, oh, here we go. Uh, that's my primary question. I've compressed my SIM results question into this. So I guess what he's saying is, how can we even include that as an option without much data and methodology? Anybody want to address this? I mean, I, I mean we do, one, like, that's kind of a weird question. It's like, oh, can't the sky be blue, you know, what it is? So that, that's it, like we are, so. We just like spent the more than an hour discussing it. So, so clearly we do. Um, then Free Trader says, okay, we got a spreadsheet. What does it mean? Where are the discussions of it? Here. We're just having a discussion about it. How is data formed? So, By simulation. So really quick, I think that the high level question Free Trader is trying to ask and I actually kind of agree with this, is if all of these were put up as proposals, and let's say they didn't come from anyone in this room, right, just to get rid of who put it in there, and everybody put forth the proposal, and we got a proposal that had no simulator, a spreadsheet with numbers that we didn't know how they were generated, and uh, they just put up forth a proposal, would people have been okay and said that that proposal was complete? And my argument would be no, absolutely not. Nobody would have said that that proposal is complete because it wasn't. And we couldn't have uh, external uh, people easily simulate the, the results or even duplicate the results that were in the existing spreadsheet. And then we had other proposals that put forth a lot more effort to make sure that the community could reproduce them and do these other things. So the question is, is how did we get something that honestly I think would have been rejected as an incomplete proposal as a, we are doing this within one of the node implementations, how did that gap occur? Because from the litmus test of if someone were to put forth this proposal, if I put forth a proposal to ABC and I didn't include any of that information, I'd expect to be laughed at. So like, I don't understand how we got to the point where something was like, we're definitely going this route, even though the proposal never occurred, the research from other teams never occurred, we couldn't duplicate the results, how how is that moving forward how do we not do yeah that? josh this is badly incorrect because everything there is based on a work by mark Lindenberg. that is like there is not even an implementation there is zero simulation there is just like an argument that is made that a difficulty adjustment using a specific mathematical form would be good and people can see that argument and can read it and see that it's good and, and therefore decide to work upon it. And, and in fact, this is how we end up having two proposals that are based on that. So after that, you can have like simulation of the specific proposal and everything. But the fact that Mark stuff was looked at and people used it and built upon it, whereas there was like zero simulation, zero implementation, zero anything, right? Because it's, it was like a research paper, that's it. Is, is like disproving the whole point that you're making. There's 20 different algorithms in the simulator right now. <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't say that's disproved at all. Even Mark's No, no, you said that if someone came with a proposal and there was no simulation result and it was not in the simulator, it would not even be looked at. And And the fact that every single proposal that we're discussing right now is based on work by Mark that had no implementation, no simulation result, and no anything is, uh, uh, you know, complete, uh, completely disproves your point. So um, I want to, Mark's had his hand up for a little while, and I apologize, I didn't see it earlier. Uh, yeah, so just... Uh, just to be clear, if, if there's any misunderstanding, the, the paper I published, it was like 
I mean, it's like, oh, here's an idea, guys. Um, and I, I never, I didn't want anyone to take my work and just run with it blindly. Because uh, I, I, yeah, because I hadn't, I hadn't run any simulations. Um, I had a pretty good feeling of what would happen, but, you know, that's not enough. Uh, and moreover, I don't think Grasberg counts as an example of my work. It's, it's a different algorithm. Um, and it, it needs to be analyzed totally separately. So um, it's, it's true that the, yeah, it's true that the exponential algorithms are probably a very fertile like ground for or framework for building new things. But uh, every time you change, every time you make a modification, you get a new algorithm and it's, it's a whole new, it's a whole new ball game, you know, so. Yeah. All right. Well, we have a couple of other hands up about just before that free trader says ABC claimed they had simulated it already, but there is almost as much evidence of that as for the data supporting the DAA choice. Um, so I'll move on to uh, Scott, I think first and then Jonathan. Okay. Um, uh, a cert was tested in early 2018 a lot in the form of WPEMA. They are the exact same algorithm to within less than 1% error. Um, and, and even an LWMA is almost, gives almost the same results. Um, and it's been tested in, you know, 50 to 100 coins. And so we have a good idea of what the results are going to be. There's been all kinds of testing on, on uh, uh, WTEMA and uh, modeling and on, a, on a CERT. And uh, uh, Grassberg is, is that algorithm, as Jonathan recommended, except it went for the, the relative form and the, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, clipping. Uh, which which is is a major change that that requires a lot of uh, test uh, testing, but uh, but I just didn't want it to go said that that this has not been tested or or that cert hasn't been uh, tested that much. So. Next, I have Jonathan. Um, so yeah, two points in response to Omri's claim that it was simulated and also that. Um, uh, Mark's proposal was a proposal without simulations and that was okay, therefore his should be uh, the same. Um, so Mark's proposal was not a hard fork proposal. It was not a uh, consensus rule change proposal. It was a proposal of an idea that other people could explore and those explorations, should they turn into hard fork proposals, should be accompanied by data. And uh, that data should be uh, open, it should be well explained, and it should be um, uh, published along with the original code. And um, Grasper did not do that. Um, so I think that that is the issue that Free Trader and Josh were trying to allude to. Um, you need to uh, provide simulation results for a hard fork proposal, um, not for just some idea that somebody puts into an academic paper, um, which may or may not be the best thing since sliced bread, uh, by the way, Mark, it totally was. Um, Point two, uh, the um, Mark's you know, assert and uh, Jacob's assert uh, proposals are remarkably stable and uh, well-behaved algorithms, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't screw it up. And uh, specifically the decision by, um, by Bitcoin ABC to add two separate and parallel feedback loops uh, both of which are re regulating block times or block intervals, makes assert technically or theoretically unstable. And um, I actually found this out by mistake because when I was sorry, sorry, you said makes assert theoretically unstable. Did sorry, you mean Grasberg? Grasberg, yes, makes Grasberg uh, theoretically unstable. And I found this out by mistake because um, when I was copying over their C plus plus code into my Python simulator, and I, when I was simulating it. I found that, the, uh, that with initial implementation, the performance was really bad. And I didn't understand why. And I, I looked into this and I'm like, wait a minute, have I found 
a bug? Have I found that Rasp doesn't work as claimed? And no, it turns out that I had just not copied it correctly. There was one constant uh, in the code that I had used uh, the, as the ideal block time, 600 seconds, instead of as the uh, ad adjustment window parameter for BTC of two weeks. And with that one change, it made the algorithm unstable. Um, so like, that's the kind of thing that you need to do simulations for. You need to be able to show that every little change that you make uh, retains the stability uh, for the algorithm, and that was not shown. Um, and yeah, that also shows that like, you can't have that kind of instability with a pure asser. It just doesn't happen. There's no constant you can change that will change uh, the stability in that fashion. It'll be like uh, overly sensitive if you turn the time constant way down, but it's not actually going to oscillate. Um, as far as I know, I haven't actually tested that theory. Mark, if you want to think about that and uh, respond. But like, there is, um, like in the oscillation that I found in uh, Grassberg, um, uh, it's not uh, significant in real world uh, circumstances, but the oscillation is still there. It's still present. It's not zero. It's slightly above zero. It's not significant, but it's not zero. And if we uh, had uh, a purely deterministic mining mechanism um, in which uh, block intervals were exactly um, difficulty over hash rate um, with no integer rounding, we would actually see the oscillations show up uh, in Grassberg um, over the time scales of uh, about two to four weeks or something like that. Um, so yeah, you need to simulate these things. You need to be able to say certainly that um, it's not going to misbehave in the parameters um, that, uh, uh, that BCH is going to be exploring. And we did not see that. So um, Josh Green has his hand up. Uh, thanks. I, I think we're just digressing a bit from the original um, point of the question, which is just the fact that we have this working group that people spend a lot of time participating in. And uh, uh, like I also spent a lot of time just listening to it so I could be up to date for what's going on. And there was no proposal made. And the proposal made did not match the conversation that was happening in the work group, which I found to be, uh, to be blatant, like very, very frustrating, uh, very, very frustrating. And uh, I think that's what the crux of uh, free traders question and comment is, is that uh, what's the point of pretending we're collaborating when uh, there is no collaboration, there is no BIP, there like the solution that you know Amari not only didn't even propose but just says we're going with uh, is contradictory to what was actually being discussed in the working group. Uh, it just doesn't. It, it just it disincentivizes collaboration. So that's what he means by, or at least that's what I interpret by him saying unilateral decision making. It just like, where did this come from? Where did historic drift come from? It just came out of left field, uh, according to the working group. It was never discussed, and now we have to go with it. And it's just like, what the, it just doesn't make any sense. So, like, what's going on? Like, I want some, like, explanation for, like, what's happening there, uh, other than just attributing, I don't know, malice. Like, that's the only other option. So I don't want to believe that, so convince me that it's not that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Are you my, wanting to, uh, Anthony wants to respond first? Sure. Well, I just wanted to, like, I'll go back to the simulation thing. Like, like Zawi mentioned that, like. Simulation is digressing, though. Like, we literally don't even care about this. Like, the, the point of the Josh, point of the let, topic Josh, on. Josh, let, let him speak, please. Uh, all right. Okay. Anyway, the point of that is, like, there's been all kinds of, like, uh, okay, maybe I won't go back onto that then. I guess the point is that, like, there was work done on the simulation and even in Amori's Gressberg article, like he says, you know, he chose the parameters based on, on a lot of the work that, that Jonathan had done on his simulations, like what the half-life constant should be and stuff like that. I mean, in terms of like cooperation, like I'm also very frustrated about this whole thing because I think it's pretty normal that if you want to get code into Bitcoin ABC, you should submit it in there. And, and I've recommended this to Jonathan multiple times. And he still, he, now he still claims that he, sub, that he like submitted a proposal, but we, you know, there's like a repository, there's Q, there's like quality assurance processes and testing on diffs and all this stuff is all set up to submit code into Bitcoin ABC. And sure, like you did it in some other repository and we're like, you know, 
hey guys come and check out what i'm doing over here you know but then also like amori mentioned drift correction and you said right in the work group like hey like if you want to do this go make your own proposal i don't agree with it so uh, like it's not like you know it's not like i think the lack of cooperation that you're perceiving is is kind of like not accurate i mean i was i was in the whole i was in the group the whole time uh and it was never discussed and finally and to the you, point you, of the you conversation, are correct, Josh. Right, just let him finish we, the right. point of the conversation is okay. that there was no proposal made at the end like the conversations were happening and then Amari goes into a back room for a week or two weeks, creates an algorithm that no one heard about, and then says, this is what we're going with. So, so basically, Not, hey guys, I have a cool are, idea. Like so there was no discussion. We were on track spending all the time to pretend anything else is dishonest and honestly is a waste of my time. Honest. That's, that's totally okay, accurate. Josh, can, you, can I speak okay, to you? Okay, get, I'm just going to call order here for a second. Yeah. I have uh, one hand up that was put up from Anthony and then Omri. Okay. Okay. Anthony first. Well, first of all, I think like accusing us of being dishonest is like, there's been a lot of well poisoning. I also read Jonathan's article right before this call, which made all kinds of serious accusations. So um, I don't know. I kind of forgot what your point was to be honest, but, but like basically, okay. Getting back to the point is like, we were on track for Jonathan and a bunch of other people working without any input from ABC and to like drop code like at the last minute, which had already like, you know, when I was saying like, hey, like guys, like let's involve Bitcoin ABC in this, in like the code review and everything. And that never happened. I'm done. Amri? Yes. Um... Josh, you must not have been paying attention, I'm sorry, because like way before there was any assert on the table, there was Carol who made a proposal to improve the TAA. It was like way before any of that mess. And this proposal included drift correction. And at the time, nobody had any problem with it. It was like part of the proposal and not an aspect of the proposal people discussed that much. And it was there. It's not something that was pulled out of a hat at the last minute. But what happened is that at some point you have this huge media campaign that is done around Azert and it's shift everybody's uh, uh, priority, shift all the discussion. And, and suddenly there is a lot of stuff that happened, you know, very quickly. And, and, and then, you know, like everybody pretend that the whole drift correction never happened before. Like everything, like all the work by Carol is suddenly ignored. Which, by the way, Carol pretty much like rage quit by now because uh, it was treated very poorly in that whole endeavor. And, and like, you know, like you come here, you don't even know he did anything, right? And, and as far as I'm concerned, he's like the dude that worked on that, that respect fully collaborated with everybody. Um, so, so, you know, like if, if you start from a premise that, that, things that happened did not happen, then obviously the conclusion that we're gonna reach are gonna be like very warped and, and not make a lot of sense. But you know, like there is not much that I can do about that. Uh, I wanna give uh, Josh a chance to respond and then we'll move to Jonathan. Uh, sure, I, I appreciate that. So um, the chat logs are public, people can look at them. There's been some discussion on Twitter about the plethora of discussion about historical drift correction. And uh, from every log I've seen, uh, it's either it's either after the proposal was made or uh, uh, has nothing to do with historical drift correction, has to do with future drift correction. So uh, that's wrong. That's completely false. People can look it up. I mean, that's all I have to say. So I, I actually do appreciate the conversation. I, I came here like I appreciate we all get I mean, together. If you came I'm, here to Armory, like blatantly present let, wrong stuff Armory, as fact. Finish, this is no, no. I'm sorry. Is blatantly lying to everybody. The fact <laughs> okay. doesn't. Okay, I'm gonna mute you for a second. I'm just gonna mute you until we get some order here, please. Oh, I think we. Just... Um, oh, I, I, I honestly don't know what to say at this point. If uh, I actually don't know what to say, so um, I do appreciate coming together. 
and I wanted this DIA conversations to be productive and I really felt that the working group was productive and I think I even discovered the working group when we attended a developer meeting uh, months ago yep. and uh, started participating from there and I was actually very optimistic for this hard fork coming up and uh, I, I, uh, I honestly feel like the rest of this conversation is just kind of moot to be perfectly honest. I, I feel like I came here with a very, very genuinely open mind about being convinced about the right alg algorithm and I think uh, there's just been a plethora of evidence against uh, Grassberg, and I think things are degrading enough. So I'll let I'll, I'll stick around for Amari to make his counterpoint. But honestly, after that, I'm I'm going to take off. So I appreciate the uh, I appreciate having me. Okay, uh, Amri's uh, left, and I'm not sure he's coming back. But yeah. I have Mark's hand up first. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to come back. I know. Okay, Mark, can you let Jonathan go first? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, Josh, quick response. I don't think that um, there's nothing left to discuss. Um, Omri did rage quit, apparently, uh, but Anthony's still here. And to be honest, I quite like Anthony. And um, even if Omri is no longer going to be a part of this community afterwards, I want Anthony to stay. Um, so I want to try to address some of the points that, uh, that Anthony made earlier. Um, so, uh, I do want um, Astrid to be, or I did want Astrid to be incorporated into Bitcoin ABC. Um, nowadays, I'm starting to not care about, that much about that. Bitcoin ABC can do whatever they want as far as I'm concerned. But I also want Astrid, uh, S33, into Bitcoin Verity. I want it into uh, Flow. I want it into Nuff. I want it into Bitcoin Unlimited. I don't have time to uh, take the proposal and put it into every single one of those notes. Um, because ABC was uh, the largest, most commonly used node, I did put more work into uh, porting my code over to that um, than I did for, for example, Bitcoin Unlimited. Um, but it's not my obligation to do that for every node. Um, and I don't think it's my obligation to do that for ABC specifically. I don't think that ABC is uh, special in that respect. Um, Bitcoin ABC has always been able to read my code. They've always been able to review it. They've been always able to comment on it. Um, they chose not to by sticking to this point of saying that it's not in um, the Bitcoin ABC code base or now it's not in reviews up uh, bitcoinabc.org. But like, does that really matter? I mean, like I've had people from all of the nodes, well, not quite all of them, but, but most of the full node implementations come over to my uh, GitLab repository and comment there or onto uh, the BCHN uh, repository because that's just where most of the um, code review is happening. Uh, Jochen Honecke has come over there and con contributed there. Um, Tom Zander, um, who has no relationship with BCHN, actually submitted merge requests onto my repository and onto Free Trader's repository because that's where the development was happening. That's where code review was happening. Um, uh, Fernando Pelliccioni uh, also uh, created a library um, to uh, embed the C++ code into Python so that it could com be compared in the simulator um, for bitwise accuracy. Um, like, these are things that Bitcoin ABC could have done, and Bitcoin ABC is just expending zero effort and then placing all the blame on me for not expending 100% of the effort. And I think that, like, yeah, it would be great if I had enough time to do that, but I just didn't have that time. And it would be nice if you guys made at least a little bit of effort. Okay, so, um, this, is, uh, this is getting a little bit uncomfortable for me. And I know you guys don't give a flying fuck about me, but I'm going to do this anyway. Um, I have tried over the last three and a half years to keep order amongst boys who continually yell at each other and, and don't listen to each other. Um, I've been on the inside and I've been on the outside of all this. I'm now part of a slander campaign that's taking place in uh, a number of the different groups. Um, I'm really fed up with it. And uh, this is the last meeting I'm gonna do um, because I don't know how to deal with you guys. It, you know, if, uh, if grown men, who you say you are, can't come together and figure something out I don't know what you're going to do. Um, I'm moving on to SLP and other things that are building on Bitcoin Cash. Regardless of the outcome of this uh, disaster, I'm going to make sure that Bitcoin Cash 
is my focus and SLP is my focus. So um, I didn't really want to end the meeting, but I certainly wanted to get that out because it's extremely frustrating. Um, and I think you've, you've all heard my story before uh, in back channels and other places. So um, please tell me what your pleasure is to do now and I'll do whatever you guys ask me to. Josh? Just wanna say I do appreciate, again, genuinely, like taking the time to put these meetings together. Uh, they've helped me, and they've helped me feel like I was part of the community, especially the earlier developer meetings when uh, I had no idea where the conversations were happening. Uh, when I first released Bitcoin Verde, I think the developer meetings were very welcoming and very useful. I do appreciate that. I, I appreciate everyone coming together and actually dealing with this stuff. I know that all of this is actually genuinely very difficult and very frustrating because there's a lot of things that we just can't fix. Um, I, I am going to be true though. I, I do. Ha I was. I was planning on leaving, you know, minutes ago. So I'm. I'm still going to leave. But I do want to also just say thanks for putting this together. I know it's. Uh, it sucks to be perfectly honest. It's difficult stuff. So, uh, thanks for having me. Okay. Um, thank you, Josh. Um, there are some further comments that I've obviously missed uh, from Free Trader. Um, so I think I'm obligated to read through what is going on. Um, I don't know what that means. Um, uh, Mark, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Mark, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say on the topic of before about what was said on the forums, he said, said this and she said that. And, uh, I can honestly say I missed all those prior discussions. Um, I, I basically, I've, I've taken a time warp from February until July. <laughs> as far as BCH is concerned. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking at this from, I'm trying to be like objective, as, as objective as I can be. And uh, just looking at what are the reasons presented now, because if, if there's the different proposals on the table, um, what are the merits, right? And I, yeah, I just, I don't see the merits for drift correction being very well presented. And it, it actually does seem what Jonathan is saying is it does seem to be backwards regarding the coin emission schedule. That is one thing that concerns me is, um, ironically, if that argument was not brought up, actually, it might have been more convincing. But now that I think about it, it, it is disturbing that the coin emission schedule is being changed to an unexpected 800 blocks per day or 800 BCH per day instead of 900. I don't think anybody expects that. So therefore, it is an ex unexpected coin emission schedule. It's, uh, I think that sums it up for me. Um, and it does bother me, yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark, I appreciate that. Um, Jonathan, I know your hand's up, but I wanna make sure everybody else gets a chance. Josh Green, your hand it's is still very up. Very quick. I just, just wanted to Jonathan, apologize. Please. I just wanted to apologize to Anthony for raising my voice earlier, that's all. <clears throat> so I think Josh Green has left. Okay. Um, but uh, what I wanted to say is I'm very much in the same boat as, as Mark um, when it comes to, uh, I didn't follow all the conversations of the DAA conversation in the work groups. Honestly, I got uh, very frustrated in the work groups um, because of side channel, just conversations that started happening. And eventually I found that it was not that productive. So I did leave the DAA work group because of that. Um, and I'm just looking at these from, you know, the point of view of two proposals and the simplicity and, uh, to me. And I'm, I just want to take a step back and what I wanted to see and just kind of want to end on a more positive note is I saw someone put forth a solid proposal. I saw somebody put a lot of effort into that proposal. I saw um, a lot of consensus on many of the implementations that that was the correct route to go. And many of the developers I've worked with in the space over the last, you know, three years of Bitcoin Cash, a majority of them that I know uh, thought that this was basically a home run. We can fix the DAA. We can all work together. We can show a, a period of unity between all of these different nodes. We can push forward together and have one fork that didn't have a bunch of drama. And I'm going to be honest, that was a reality that could have happened. And so anybody that made that reality not happen, whether that was animosity between the sides or whatever it was, really what should reflect on like what could have happened. What could have happened was a massive win, collaboration between a bunch of smart people and a sign that we want the best developers to put forth the best proposals and that it was merit-based and that we could move forward together. 
And I find it a complete failure that we couldn't get there. And I'm not going to attribute blame as to where that failure lied, but there was a failure because we're not there. And we could have been there. And that's what I kind of want to just end on because I'm just disappointed that we couldn't see that light and work together as a team. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Jacob? All right. I, I think Anthony actually uh, had his hand up at some point. Oh, sorry. I missed it. Anthony, did you have I your hand up? hand up for a while, but I'm sorry. I didn't see it. Yeah. I basically want to agree with Josh. I think it's, it is a failure that this is degenerated to this status. Um, I also basically want to address what Jonathan said, like, and also in the context, he just published an article right before this meeting, basically calling ABC dishonest and saying that it should be disbanded and replaced. Um, and I think that like, it's totally, I mean, personally, I think no one's put more into this project than Amori and to like, and like to impugn his motives like that and say like, oh, I hope you stay around after he leaves or, or that sort of thing. Um, I, I totally object to those comments. And I think I'm gonna leave the meeting also because my time's up anyway, so. Thank Bye. you, Anthony. Um, thank you for attending. Uh, Jacob? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. First, just uh, especially to you, David, but also to other people. I mean, I, I know this is all very uh, frustrating and all that. So uh, I do appreciate, you know, I think everyone here has good intentions. That's that's my read. And uh, it's not new to me that smart technical people with good intentions can come to huge screaming fights. This is like, this is part of my, my learning of crypto. So um I think we should all try to take it, uh, try to avoid taking it too personally, but I, I, I do appreciate it. I mean, David, like, you know, all the work that's gone into arranging these calls, I think they've been very beneficial. Obviously it would be nice if it was all kumbaya at the end, but sometimes you don't get that or sometimes you don't get that as quickly as you hope. So uh, I just wanna make sure you don't think this is a negative. This, this to me has been a very positive contribution to the community. Thank and you. For that. Sure, and I'm sure a lot, of, I mean, you can see on the comments, a lot of people feel the same way. And my, my second comment is like, I know we're here to talk about. I know we're here to talk about the DAA and technical topics, but just to digress very briefly for a second here, like there is a context where, you know, for example, BTC fees crossed five dollars last week. Um, they did that in 2017. Maybe they'll cross fifty dollars like they did then. Maybe they'll keep going. So, BCH is is a minority chain. It's a much smaller project, but part of the reason even relative outsiders like me have retained a lot of interest in it is because there is this there is this opportunity in the future. I mean, the user experience is begin, gonna become more and more important. And I think that it's, it's reasonably likely that in months or at least year or two to come, more and more attention will turn to BCH as users get frustrated with the alternatives. And for me, more important than the DAA, more important than ACERT or anything like that, is if users of Bitcoin get frustrated with the, you know, with BTC and with, with high fees and and, and clog chain and they look around, it will be very beneficial to what I think all of us are trying to accomplish if they turn and they see like, oh, here's Bitcoin Cash. It's sort of like Bitcoin, but it's a lot easier to use and a lot, a lot more pleasant to use. If they turn around and they see, oh, there's BTC and then there's, you know, there's, there's Bitcoin ABC and there's Bitcoin SV and there's Bitcoin Tumim and there's, you know, Bitcoin some other fork off. I think that will be a real loss, a real missed opportunity. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's being decided here today. I think there's various ways forward, but I, I just, maybe it's partly as a Canadian, we're sort of conflict averse, but I, I, I think it's uh, <laughs> everyone, everyone involved in all this has an incentive in trying to stay together when possible. Forking, splitting off is always an option, must always be an option, but it should really be, I think, a last resort. So that's all I was really going to say. Jacob, yeah. Jacob, I can't tell you how much I appreciate finding out you're Canadian. Now I know why I liked you so much. Uh, I okay. I make Sorry. Comment. Moving on. Um, Chris Pat Pat's here. Yeah. I mean, you got to look at w what we're facing here. Is the inability to come to an agreement here is going to basically blow up Bitcoin Cash, right? We're going to drop out if if we fork over this or anything else. BCH is going to drop out of the top ten. You know it is on on the market cap list. We're going to, you know, our market cap is going to be split between, you know, probably 50, 50 or 60, 40 or something like this. Again, we're going to drop below BSV, right. And, and have all them rub it in our face uh, over and over again. Um, and I, I mean, what is the prospects even from there ever getting back into the top 10 at this point after that, right. 
I mean, at some point when we're talking about consensus rules that have to be followed in this way, we have to have, we have to find a, an ability to come to a compromise no matter what, right? Whether that's, you know, get, you know, both sides giving and taking or whatever it takes, but just to have, have this whole thing like blow up because this is all of us basically. I mean, we, we're all like working in this, this project, you know, our futures are on this. A lot of our investment is in, in here. Our income is in here. And to have this whole thing just blow up like this because we can't come to agreement. Uh, I mean, frankly, it's really shitty. It's like really, really shitty. And you know, it's, it's, I, it's not just this, it's, it's this, it's the IFP, it's, it's everything. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I feel like a cryptocurrency project, you know, shouldn't be going through and having these type of problems. It should be easier for us <laughs> to come to some sort of agreement um, than it actually is. And it's just, if we, if we can't, and if we're just going to all rage quit and everything like this, I mean, you know, people are going to walk away. It's not just dropping in the market cap. We're going to, people are going to walk away great people like Mark, who's been like a huge contribution to us is just gonna turn around and walk away. Jonathan, everyone, I mean, we're done if, if this blows up. So, I mean, I don't know, uh, it's, it's really like we're like staring at the end in the face right now, unless we can, can pull a rabbit out of the hat and it's just really unfortunate. I had uh, Scott's hand up first. Okay, I, I wanted to say you've done a, a great job, uh, David. And uh, the, the last meeting was very frustrating for me. It was like there was this undertone and that there was zero progress. But uh, everything came out today, uh, complaints about Jonathan and Omri. Um, and and I, I think the honesty made this a much better discussion. I wouldn't change anything. Uh, I think it is uh, everything went uh, very well. You you ex expressed some things about how it was falling apart and everything, but I, to me this went very smoothly, and it and it was exactly what it needed to be. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> I'm I might feel a little bit different in an hour or so, but thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Uh, Jonathan, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson. No, I just made that up. I have no idea who said it. <laughs> Jeff K. Oh, okay. You yeah, that guy. Um, okay. Uh, uh, I want to give, um, I, I don't know whether we've got any uh, questions from the audience. There was a lot of stuff came in. Um, I don't know whether I really want to read it all. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. Anybody else want to wrap up with some comments about where they think things should go? I'd be done for some Q&A with the uh, peanut gallery, the Zoom peanut gallery. Okay. Um, uh, I won't even know where to begin here. Can you guys see the questions and answers? Um, so we start from the last one, maybe. Uh, Monica says, historical drift correction is controversial, but business, businesses, miners, and major stakeholders have requested fixing historical drift. This controversy is creating unnecessary stress for investors. I think that's more of we, a statement. Yeah. We can't answer that. That would be Omri and Anthony. They're not here. So I think we should skip that question. Okay. Uh, next one is Josh is wrong. We have 99.9% .9 of block space headroom and a six month hard fork schedule for which to increase the block size if by a wonderful occurrence demand spikes up within the years in which blocks will come slower. So transaction throughput will not be affected. Um, it's a statement. That's, yeah, it's a reasonable point. Um, we do have a lot of headroom. Uh, but it only applies to throughput. It doesn't apply to the other user experience issues. Definitely not to confirmation times. Definitely not to the 50 transaction uh, uh, per block uh, chain limit, which is actually an uh, impact for businesses. So I would say, uh, anonymous attendee, you are uh, technically correct on that specific issue. Uh, uh, Zach McRolf 
said, just to note, the widely announced Twitch discount for BitPay payments requires one confirmation. Waiting 10 minutes is already painful. Let's not make it 11. I think that's just another statement. Um, I'm also seeing some comments showing up in the, um, in the chat window. So I think I'm going to go with that first. Um, oh, these were just to the panelists. Oh, yeah, we have that wonderful, lovely person, Kaylin, in here talking about um, what the problems are. So I'm going to ignore him because he's a lying SOB. Um, and I got that out of the way because I'd planned on doing that for a long time. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop being political and just uh, try and hand this back to some medium of order before we wrap up. Um, Can we open the floor? Yeah, and, uh, please. In, anything, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people uh, like and want to hear from Mark. So I, I want to make sure Mark has said if you think he might want to. And Great uh, idea. There, there, may, there may be other things. We just want to discuss small things may, unrelated to a lot of what has been said so far. But go ahead. If you have anything, Mark. If you, yeah, uh, I don't know. I have a lot of thoughts that um, it's hard to put into words. Um, but uh, if people have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. If you guys have questions for me. Um, yeah, uh, I did want to say one thing, by the way, uh, David, you mentioned that, I mean, people are doing like slander campaigns and whatever. And I just, you know, I just want to say like to everybody, there, there's no, there's no need to go into like this, like toxicity thing and, you know, really getting shitty and personal and all this stuff. Cause even if it's happening to you, you know, it's, um, if, if you wrestle with pigs, you all, you both get dirty kind of thing, you know? Yeah, I know. It's very hard. I've been, uh, I've been sort of suppressing it for long enough that I'm getting cancer. No, I'm not, yeah. but yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what it feels, that's what it feels <laughs> like. So, um, I just, I'm sorry. I, I apologize to everybody for blowing up a little bit. So, um, I, I do remind people on occasion that I am human. So, um, yeah. But, you know, there really is no excuse for the kind of behavior that has gone on uh, in this community. And, and actually, I'm one of these people that doesn't believe there is even a community. It would be like saying there's a community of people that uses money. I mean, and it's every kind of person in the world. Um, so, you know, whenever money's involved, things tend to go a little bit sideways. So. I, I just don't see how anybody reasonable can be saying nasty things about you. you you're moderating you're doing it fairly. I, I, I would just, I would think they need to be completely ignored. Um, and, and Jonathan, uh, you're the one that wanted to open the floor. Was there anything else you wanted to cover? I've been talking a lot. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I could say that um, uh, Kalen is definitely a hard person to get along with. Um, and I have been interacting with him uh, a fair amount recently. Um, because of code review and other things. But um, uh, something that you just have to keep in mind is that some people have very different cultural standards for how they interact. And some people are just uh, aggressive because they think that it's important to be uh, direct and honest. Um, and with those people, you just have to modulate your own interaction style um, to uh, be basically on the same level. It doesn't, just because somebody's being aggressive doesn't mean that they are necessarily um, uh, mean to you or that they hate you. Um, it just means that they maybe are playful, maybe they're just um, uh, stating their uh, opinion in a, an unpleasant way. And sometimes um, the best way to defuse that situation is to um, play back. Don't take it seriously, but just, um, just learn that that person needs a different type of hand. And um, I think that Kaylin uh, definitely falls into that uh, category. Like uh, one of the first things that I did with him on the BCHN Slack is I insulted his face and he loved it. Um, <laughs> so like, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it can be difficult to uh, be a Canadian working with a Romanian, um, but you can learn how to do it and um, it will be formed for you, but. Um, I will uh, I'll work on that in my next incarnation, which I think is coming up pretty soon. So yeah. we'll see where things go, guys. Um, 
anyway, I appreciate the positive comments coming out of this. It would be nice if things ended on a free note um, or a better note. Um, oh, somebody asked me if ABC has ever paid me. <laughs> I love this question. No, ABC has never paid me. I have paid. And there are people in this conference call right now who know that. So I'm going to leave that alone because uh, that's just shit. So thank you for that lovely thing. That you there, just... There's one good question for Mark uh, from Free Trader. The polynomial approximation. I can, I can read it out. Uh, Mark, was, Mark, there was some discussion about tweaking the poly approximation in Asset 3i or I3 2D. Is there much to be gained? Um, probably a little bit. Um, I, I left a comment on the on the GitLab about how I came up with my numbers, and you can see it was just you know really quick and dirty. Uh, but I, I was I was fairly confident that I got close, and it seems to be that's true. Um, but I also knew that it was is possible to do better, probably a little bit. Um, so uh, I don't. Uh, that I, yeah, think I don't, I don't have a, any strong opinions about people have to use my polynomial, but uh, I think it's a it's a good place to start. Maybe you know. Yeah. Um, it, it correct me if this is uh, wrong. Um, it 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 needs to be improved for relative assert. It it could use some improvement for relative, but not for absolute. If that's correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this this yeah. is something that I sort of realized uh, as I was doing more analysis again recently is that. Uh, yes, relative assert needs the relative assert or relative exponential or simple, simple exponential is Jacob's name. Um, it needs a bit better accuracy because of the accumulation of errors. We, we, we mentioned this a bit before and specifically it needs to be like a factor of, I would say 300 better or something like this for our half-life. So yeah, that's a pretty big factor. And um, the the exponential that I came up with actually I would say is not appropriate for the relative exponential. It, it, it could probably be abused because of yeah. the accumulation of errors. So, and, and something else I want to throw out uh, there for those listening, uh, Mark, you and I uh, have a, a strong preference, I would think, for the WT EMA. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that, that it is a very close approximation to a CERT, and it's a lot simpler without the exponential function. Yeah. Uh, but I went round and round with Jonathan on this. I, I try to argue against it, and he, he, always, he always got me. Uh, there just didn't seem to be a good way around the out-of-sequence uh, timestamp. Now, now uh, you could be backwards compatible and say, if there's any timestamp that's more than six hours before the previous timestamp, uh, uh, don't let it or limit it to that. Uh, then the WT EMA could not have that negative soft time problem and, and work fine and be backward compatible. So maybe it might help consensus concerns somewhere. Um, but uh, but I, I just wanted to mention that it, it would have been a lot nicer if we, we could have uh, adopted the no out of sequence timestamp rule. But of course, it's a big change. and. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, uh, WTEMA is basically uh, assert if you use the approximation that 2 to the x equals 1 plus x. Um, and that turns out to be a pretty decent approximation for the purposes of a difficulty adjustment algorithm, which is kind of surprising because it's not actually that uh, accurate of an approximation. But for like small signal, especially for the relative. Yeah, I think, I think, I think Mark decent. and I, uh, I think Mark and I want to correct you. I think that uh, it needs to be e to the x approximately equals one plus x. I think there might be a problem if you use two to the x. Is that what you were wanting? Uh, okay, yeah, there, there, yeah, sure. Um, fine. Uh, yeah, so, so e to the x, uh, one plus x. Um, now, with, uh, with the assert approximations, um, we do the uh, first step of shifting the, um, the domain of the function into the zero to one uh, range. And we do that using the uh, two to the x plus n equals two to the n times uh, two to the x um, uh, identity. And if you combine that identity 
uh, and shifting with the um, e to the x or 2 to the x equals 1 plus x approximation, then you get SRT1, which is a, an algorithm that I tested and put into the simulator. And as far as I can tell, it works fine. It's um, actually, so like uh, in the simulations, uh, w tama is a little bit off of assert, of the, the true floating point assert. Um, it came a little bit late in all the simulations. Uh, assert one was about the same amount of total error, but it was a little bit early. And like, it was um, basically the same kind of uh, perform or, or within the same class of performance uh, as w tama. Um, and the, one of the interesting things about assert one is that it does not suffer from uh, extreme timestamp issues that uh, 2 to the x plus n equals 2 to the x times 2 to the n identity allows for extreme uh, uh, solve times to be handled nearly as accurately as floating point uh, uh, assert does. Um, so yeah, th there's a lot of different options there that are, that are, I think, pretty interesting. But we can do a really high accuracy thing that just obviates it. I'm going, to put, I'm going to put my hand up. Um, I had no idea that we're actually at two hours and uh, 20, uh, 25 minutes. Um, and we were prepping an hour before this meeting. So I would like to wrap it up, guys. Are you okay with that? Okay. Um, I'm not going to draw any conclusions about what's going to happen next because I need to, frankly, I need to go to the beach and walk my dog. Um, and I think uh, a little bit of downtime might be good for everybody at this point. So I'll look forward to you uh, figuring this out because you guys are the developers. Um, and I'm looking forward to Bitcoin Cash succeeding. You know, that's what I'm here for. So let's make sure that it happens. And thank you very much for attending today. I appreciate it. And I apologize to you, Free Trader. There was so much stuff going by on my screen. If I missed anything that you were trying to say, I'm sorry. So thank you, David. Thank you all. Au revoir. Oh, that's French, isn't it?